the year 2020 was a new beginning for me. My school days were forever behind me. I was a real adult in the real working adult world, though some would say I'm still not one. Part of my goal for the new year was to expand my horizons in, in terms of tastes. Try some big new games that the older, more stubborn me would never give a try. At one time, I was a part of the anti-RPG crowd, those who say RPGs are boring, way too long, too complicated, too anime-y for me. Even though I very much enjoyed the simplified stylings of the various Super Mario RPGs, Rip Alpha Dream. Getting into one of the most time-consuming video game genres when you are no longer a kid with tons of free time wasn't the best plan, but it was now or never. Ironically, due to an unrelated world event, I was given more free time than I maybe ever had in my entire life. I sunk many hours into Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, Persona 5 Royal, all because of an event that would forever change the world in March 2020. One month before the release of Final Fantasy VII Remake. See, I've always had my own secret bucket list of games to get to before I die. Regardless of my thoughts on whatever genre the game belongs to, if enough people are talking about it, I have to play it. And how could Final Fantasy VII not be on that list? I put it off for years. Enough years for Remake to come out. And although I was still a bit scared to make the jump knowing what this might do to me, one day, months before the game came out, it was randomly on sale for just $45. And I said, all right, you got me. And so I had the treasured first Final Fantasy experience. It was a lovely time, but I was right to be scared because all I wanted to do after finishing the game was to go back. I have this problem where I'm obsessed with doing everything in like the correct order. I always try to go back and everyone's telling me, no, 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 you don't have to play the old ones to understand. You don't have to do that. There's no story connections. There's no reason to do all that work in order. Come on, be serious. But they don't know why I do it. Somebody actually told me, unironically, you know, Final Fantasy 1 doesn't play anything like Final Fantasy 7 Remake. Oh, really? And of course everyone else gave me the same explanation you give to any new Final Fantasy fan. The main lines are not actual sequels, there's no story connection, they all start from square one, yada yada. I'm like, I know. But there is an overarching story that connects all the mainline games. If you've watched this show in order, you've seen it too. It's a story of the evolution of video games. The humble beginnings, the discovery of what people really love in a game, the experimental era where crazy ideas are being thrown around left and right, all the way through to the hardships of modern gaming, where games take six years to come out, cost insane amounts of money, and are accompanied by the most greedy, cynical spin-offs you've ever seen. I wanted to experience this story firsthand and I didn't want it to get spoiled more than that already had. I knew after beating a remake that the story kind of assumed that you did play 7 beforehand, so you could be surprised at all the weird new changes. So I told myself I would go back and play Final Fantasy 7 before the release of Remake Part 2. It's one thing to play the clean, new versions of Xenoblade and Persona 5, but I should go back and experience what a real, crusty PS1 RPG plays like. But then, if I'm gonna do that, Final Fantasy 4 and 6 are also on my secret bucket list of games. So is Chrono Trigger. And if I'm gonna do 4 and 6, why not 5? 
Why don't people talk about five the way they talk about four and six? Maybe I should see. Why don't I do the first three before that? I mean, if I do the Super Nintendo games, it's gonna be really hard to go back and play the really crusty, really old NES games, so I should just start from the beginning. Now that I think about it, Final Fantasy X is a bucket list game as well. If I'm gonna play one through seven, you see where this is going. What well, started out as, I guess I'll pick up this game because people love seven so much, turned into, I will play every game ever released in this franchise if it is the last thing I do. And it was for no reason other than my weird obsession with doing things in order and this meta-completionist challenge I gave myself that ended up being way harder than I thought it would be. And now here we are, talking about a game I've been thinking about talking about for literally three years. Rebirth is here, and I have finished reviewing every Final Fantasy game that released before I started this show. Technically, what every Final Fantasy game meant back then ends with this game. You hear that? You hear that, powers that be? Whoever's in charge here? We've now had four years of internet discourse about this game and whether or not it was good. Well, not to spoil my conclusion, but I think any reasonable person without a poll too far up their butt can probably see this game is at least good. Most of the initial anger, understandably, had to do with fans feeling betrayed by the creators who sold them on something that wasn't exactly what they were getting. But let's not pretend that the Final Fantasy VII purists would have been satisfied with anything other than a one-to-one -one remake with updated graphics. If you can accept that the creatives in charge had ideas so significantly more ambitious than that, to give us something unprecedented in video game history, it becomes a lot more exciting to talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake. By the way, I'm tired of people getting this name wrong. I've seen so many comments, so many tweets, or official reviews referring to this game as the Final Fantasy VII Remake, or Final Fantasy VII The Remake, or The Remake of Final Fantasy VII, all of which are incorrect and imply something the game is not, a remake of an old game. If we want to talk about what this game really is and what its sequels might entail, we must first talk about Hideaki Anno's legacy work, Neon Genesis Evangelion. One of the most influential 26 anime episodes of all time has its place in American television history, but it's nothing compared to how this series is treated in Japan. If you ever got tired of seeing Star Wars branded paper towels, salad, and basically anything you can think of, get ready for official Evangelion shaving razors, fishing lures, Nest Cafe Gold Blend Barista coffee machines, and what's this? They have it! Canned bread! So in 2007, when the theatrical film Evangelion 1.0 You Are Not Alone released, it was a national event akin to Star Wars The Force Awakens. It was a retelling of the first few episodes of the show in a new form. Some would call it a remake of sorts. But by the 2009 sequel, Evangelion 2.0, You Can Not Advance, significant changes and brand new characters appeared for the first time, showing that the story was going to take a surprising change in course, and boy did it in 2012 with Evangelion 3.0, You Can Not Redo. Such dramatic changes in not just the storyline, but even the way the story was told caused massive backlash from fans. And a few years later, development would begin on Final Fantasy VII Remake. My point in bringing this up is to try and understand more what they're doing. This series of Evangelion films was not called a remake or a reboot. It was called a rebuild. A reboot, by definition, is starting the story over again from scratch, maybe changing some things slightly, maybe adding some brand new stuff, but ultimately telling the same story and reintroducing it for a new audience. Not to be confused with the term Legacy Sequel, 
popularized by Star Wars The Force Awakens, which accomplishes the same goal as a reboot while technically being an all-new story with new characters, often featuring the original cast in some form passing the torch to a new one. That's not something we've seen just yet in video games, and this is probably because animated characters can never die, and they can always just get a new voice actor. Though I wouldn't put it past Naughty Dog to give us an Uncharted like a sequel in the distant future. God of War, 2018, was marketed as a reboot so that new players like me, who hadn't played any of the old games because they couldn't on the non-backwards compatible PS4, could still jump into it without worry. This is an instance where that was just a straight up lie, because in some ways it is technically rebooting many aspects of the God of War franchise, but story-wise, it was a direct sequel to the last game, so I was lost in a lot of places. To my knowledge, this term, rebuild, has not been properly defined because I've only seen it used for this one series of Evangelion movies. But I would define it as starting a story over from the same beginning point, but continuing in a completely different direction, probably including some meta-commentary involving the original story. And that's the key difference. A reboot starts something over for a new audience to enjoy, while a rebuild explicitly assumes the viewer is an old audience who knows about the original so they can subvert their expectations. Anno coined a new term to the industry that I believe had to have inspired the developers of this game. And on this review, I give you two different perspectives. One as a new audience I was four years ago when this game came out and I knew nothing. And a second one as the old audience I now am, having played every game that preceded it. And yes, it is a team making this game also getting tired of people dogpiling on Nomura whenever anything story related annoys them. As if he's not working with several other Final Fantasy legends. Kitase, Nojima, Toriyama. This ain't Business Division Unit 3. This is Business Division Unit 1. So, Remake is a subtitle. But the basic pitch of this story is the plot from Final Fantasy 7, up to the point where the team leaves Midgar. I was pretty surprised on that episode of Refoid when it only took me about six hours to get through that part. It wasn't even one proper third of the game. The pacing felt so fast having played Remake first, but really it's the new one that slows everything down. Aside from fans being angry at the story changes in the new meta narrative, the second biggest issue they had was with the pacing. How can you reasonably stretch six hours of introductory RPG gameplay and stretch it into a full 26 hour adventure with its own beginning, middle, and end? The answer is you extend everything. Every place you go in the original game is like its own full chapter now and there's also new places that weren't even there at all. I would love to compare the two games more closely but I'm no Final Fantasy VII expert. I just played it one time two and a half years ago in between Final Fantasy VI and Final Fantasy Tactics. There's plenty of experts on this game elsewhere online. But you don't need to be an expert to notice things being stretched out. You don't even need to have played the original game at all. I remember my first playthrough thinking, hmm, I'm gonna say that moment when Cloud met Aerith and she was frozen in time as a ghost appeared, that's probably new. If you're the type who just wants to get on with it, there's a few instances in this game that will really test your patience. But if you're one who likes to stop and smell the roses, you will adore this game. Because Final Fantasy VII Remake picks you up from the neck and shoves you into every flower you see without getting any input from you so that you no longer have a sense of smell by the end of it. Luckily, I really like flowers. See, there's one thing I've been asking for over the course of Rethoid. I want a Final Fantasy story that's a little scaled back. I don't want every single game to be about killing God. And although they do make you fight a giant godlike entity at the end, that whole segment is pretty disconnected from the rest of the story. The plot in a nutshell, is you're a bunch of eco-terrorists trying to take down a big corporation, and that's it. Most of the meat of the journey is figuring out how to fix whatever is currently making it hard to do that. Act 1 is trying to plant bombs and getting caught. Act 2 is trying to reunite with your team after falling into some girl's church. 
Act 3 is trying to climb the tower to rescue said girl. In between the gameplay are scenes where the characters have all the time in the world to get to know each other because they're not so concerned about moving on to the next plot point. And that is honestly a breath of fresh air. Especially because I love these characters and I am more concerned with getting to know them too. I don't think Final Fantasy VII Remake has a pacing issue. A pacing issue implies the pacing is unbalanced and some moments are way too fast while others are way too slow. It's a consistency issue. The best example would be maybe Final Fantasy XV. Seven Remake is very consistent. It's just slow the whole way through. And that might get a little boring for some. Did I need the extended bike segment with that weirdo who like dances with his bike? No. Did I need a second run through the sewers so that Leslie can get his lost pendant back? Not really. Did I need Tifa's little monkey bar adventure? Maybe not. But each of these moments comes with a slew of memorable character interactions that I cherish. I'm not gonna pretend like I gave a cray up about Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse in the original. They die like one hour in and barely talk to me. In this one, I love them all, even if Jessie makes me uncomfortable with how flirty she is. How many Final Fantasy games have you going to someone's mom's house to try her famous pizza? This is the stuff I live for. And we should be so privileged to have the voice acting talents of Badger from Breaking Bad. Did I need an extended journey to Shinra Tower, climbing up broken buildings and fighting tough enemies in front of a breathtaking sunset? Yeah. That was like the most memorable and most fun area to go through. Did I need to spend that much time in Wall Market? Uh, kinda, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget most of what happened there. I'll never forget Cloud walking out of the Honey Bee Inn just trying to blend in with the crowd and not confront you. I'll never forget Aerith slamming that guy in the face with a folding chair. The Wall Market segment is a 10 out of 10. I wonder if that's because they focus on expanding and otherwise faithfully recreating iconic moments instead of having ghosts appear to do something. We'll talk about the ghosts. But Wall Market is really where it got fun. It didn't matter how many slow parts followed. They hooked me on chapter 9 and I was ready to follow these guys anywhere. And how could you not fall in love with these guys? Remake just has the four playable characters, Cloud, Tifa, Barrett, and Aerith, and for almost the entire game, you're only playing with two or three of them. So we get to focus more closely than ever on specific character pair-ups, and it also allows for boss fights to be built around the characters you're using, a la Final Fantasy IV, which I always think makes for a mechanically more satisfying experience. Parties are small, like Final Fantasy XIII, but we're not constantly jumping between multiple groups. You stay with the main guy, like Final Fantasy XV, but you can actually play as and build your party members to your liking. Plus, they don't randomly leave to be in a DLC episode or something, but they do leave. After Cloud falls into Aerith's church, you don't see Barrett for a long time. And actually, Aerith is only playable for six of the game's 18 chapters. It was never a big problem for me because I was always happy with whoever I was around and the characters still developed naturally. In the short time Tifa and Aerith are together, they spend most of it bonding over their troubled situation and also making fun of Cloud. Even the stock dialogue that's used after winning battles will change as Cloud gets closer with Barrett. In the beginning, Cloud's all like, yeah, whatever. But then in the last few chapters, we see Barrett's high energy finally cut through Cloud's stone wall. And the game is funny, too. Like, most of the line delivery is good, and some of the dialogue is weird, but still good in a different way. Like, when you're fighting the bike guy, and Jesse's like, what's this guy's deal? And Cloud responds, same shit, being a dumbass. Really, anything with Wedge is great. My favorite line read in the whole game is probably this one. Oh, uh... Don't tell Jesse about this little chat, okay? When she gets pissed, ooh, she gets punchy. Well, no promises. He's serious, Cloud. She'll beat the shit out of us. There's definitely humor in most Final Fantasy games, but this one is cracking jokes often. And that's something that makes me fall in love with characters faster than anything. They made Don Corneo even more pervy than I could have ever expected, and even the new characters have some standout moments. 
The one relationship with the main cast that doesn't get very developed would have to be Aerith and Barrett, because they basically swap out for each other at both major turning points, only really meeting at like chapter 17. But they do their best by having those two bond over their very own boss fight, which was great. Then there's Red 13, infamously not playable because he shows up too late for that to make sense. It's definitely a little weird why he's so willing to follow these guys, especially through to the final boss sequence, like what the dog doing here? But any concerns with the characters can be pretty quashed just by remembering there's gonna be two more of these games. They didn't try to shoehorn in a whole like Red 13 section to make his gameplay time extended. They, they know he's gonna be in Rebirth, so they don't have to squeeze him in like that. He's there, but he's not a full playable character. Anything you miss in this game is just gonna be in a later game. And that's when I get so excited. It's already so memorable and fun, and this is just part one. I hope they don't mess it up. But why don't we get into how fun it is? Like I said in the beginning, the evolution of these combat systems is the story that ties all these games together. We've been watching the slow metamorphosis from turn-based to action game, culminating in Final Fantasy XV. But Seven Remake returns to a hybrid nature by mashing real-time action and positioning with ATB. Luckily, every environment in Midgar is conveniently wide and great for battling random monsters. I've heard this combat system criticized a lot online. That was a little surprising to me as way back on my first playthrough, I found it to be incredibly fun. I thought maybe after Final Fantasy's entire history was under my belt and I gave this a good critical second look, I would get the complaints. On the other hand, fans of this system will often say Final Fantasy XV's combat was a warm up for this. XV walked, so Seven Remake could run. I wouldn't say the two are that similar, but I do think the combat in this is better than 15 in uh, every conceivable way. Yeah, I still don't get the haters. Even after playing all the other entries, I consider this system to be one of the most fun. You are less mobile than 15 in general. No warping, no jumping. Each character has a basic attack they can do freely and a special that's unique to them. You are allowed up to two ATB charges with which you can use abilities or spells, and then you gotta have a limit break in there as well. I found it was most close to Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII, but instead of switching between three ATB bars on one person, you switch between three people, each with one ATB bar. What's fun is how different each character plays before you even dive into their unique abilities. Cloud can switch into a heavy stance to deal big damage just like Zack in Crisis Core. Meanwhile, Tifa is the fast one who's way better at staggering enemies and charging ATB. Barrett and Aerith are both long-ranged projectile characters, which is because of what I was talking about earlier, how they swap with each other in the story, and someone always needs to be in that role because Tifa and Cloud are garbage at fighting anything in the air. We'll get to Materia in a sec, but that's what really opens the door to flesh out the roles of the characters. What elevates the combat to something truly special is your ability to switch to characters in battle. It changes everything. The original philosophy of ATB is alive and well again as you're managing all three bars at the same time. But you have the added task of managing position and even dodge rolling while you wait. It's pretty slow to charge, but hitting things makes it go up way faster, which means whoever you're playing as is going to be ready to strike way earlier than the other two. You're encouraged to give attention to each of them as much as you can because when you get a combo going and you wipe the floor with a tough enemy, it's euphoric. Comboing is key. Unlike most any other ATB system, sometimes it's better to just stay at a full bar to await the perfect time to strike. If you're dealing with small fry, maybe you're a little lax. With the shoulder buttons, you can command the other party members without switching to them, so they use that ability from wherever they currently are. You're fighting one guy, Tifa's fighting another guy, you tell her to hit him with a dive kick while you finish this one off. And boom, you kill two enemies at the same time without even looking at one of them. If it sounds like a lot to manage, as soon as you go into the command menu, time slows down massively so you can take a breather and think about what you're doing. It also means you can actually command three abilities all at once to start a big combo. And I want to explain what makes that so special. This game is the closest I've ever felt to actually controlling an entire party of characters. When I say I get a combo going, I'm not referring to any actual mechanic or combo meter or anything like that. I'm talking about the actual actions that I'm doing. 
RPG haters like to argue about stuff like EXP standing in for actual experience. Like you're not improving because you're getting better at the game. You're improving because the number went up in the game and made you stronger. I totally get that mindset and tend to enjoy how more and more RPGs are steering away from that or at least lowering the emphasis on it. If you feel that way, this is a game for you. In Persona 5, the game I played right after this one in the fateful summer of 2020, you can perform an all-out attack after fulfilling certain conditions. It's done with the push of a button as a stylish cutscene plays, showing your team beating up the enemy and dealing a ton of damage. That's cool. In Final Fantasy VII Remake, I can execute my own custom all-out attack by using the actual moves in the game in a sequence that builds with each step and results in the enemy being torn to shreds. Tifa, set up T-Trap and Unbridled Strength for a short buff. Boom, we staggered the guy, so we now have a limited time for max damage potential. Cloud, hit him with a few to fill your ATB, then start Infinity's End, which takes a sec. Now switch to Barrett, who now has Limit Break. When we're not watching the animation, because immediately we switch back to Tifa, Omni Strike to increase the damage multiplier, and get those last few hits in as Cloud and Barrett finish attacking before the stagger period is over, and woo, he's dead. What a rush. You can't always pull something like that off perfectly, but when you do, it's just the best. After Persona 5 Royal, I played Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, another RPG with a bit more action focus like Final Fantasy VII Remake. I couldn't pull off anything nearly as cool as I could in Remake. The moves were all less interesting, you walk even slower, you can't switch party members, they're all just kind of doing their own thing with AI. To this day, I think my opinions on that game are tainted because I just compare it too much to this. But here's where some take issue. Stunlock is a big complaint, especially at high level play. There are occasional moments where an enemy can juggle you and overwhelm you so fast that you just die, and there's very little you can do to fix that. I don't have much of an argument against that other than it barely ever happened to me and it's hardly worth talking about other than to show you that the system isn't perfect. I hear other frustrations over getting knocked out of your healing animation, losing the heal, and the ATB to execute said heal. That's pretty devastating. Here's my argument for that, and I'm sorry, but skill issue. This situation happened to me a bunch and it certainly is frustrating, but every time it happened, I waited for the next opportunity and timed my heal better like after successfully dodging something, and it worked. I really don't consider this a flaw. Do you ever pop your Estus flask in Dark Souls but get slammed before it works? It's usually your fault. Healing is something that should take skill. Remember how Final Fantasy XV suffered when healing cost essentially nothing? The potion spam thing has been fixed simply with the existence of an ATB bar. Using a potion or any item uses up a bar, so you can't spam them nearly as fast, but the issue with 15 wasn't even about the healing, it was the fact that potions took you out of an incapacitated state that should otherwise be difficult to do. That state doesn't exist in this, if your HP drops to zero, you just die. You can stock up on a lot of potions, but using them over and over is about as effective as it is in any other mainline besides 15, which is to say, not much at all. Also, unlike 15 and 13, you don't game over when Cloud dies. It's only over when your full party is wiped out, so even if you feel some of the stuff is a bit too unforgiving, you can still come back from very bad positions if you play your cards right. I have one honest complaint myself. I'm always trying to set up these cool combos I'm going on about, but every boss in the game has so many damn phases. I feel like every time I finally max out the stagger gauge, I'm about to go all out, and then the boss changes to a new phase, and I wasted all my big attacks during his temporary immunity. It happened quite a lot. My favorite bosses were the ones with no extra phases, but they were few and far between. Otherwise, I really love this system. Now's a good time to mention I achieved 100% completion in this game. Every side quest, all combat arenas, and every super boss. I'm very familiar with these mechanics and how hard those fights are. So I feel more qualified talking about them than any of the other combat systems we've discussed on Refoid. If any 7 Remake combat haters are watching, I'd love to get into it because I still haven't heard any really solid arguments against it. But a combat system is more than the fighting itself. Let's talk about Materia. This is probably the most mechanically similar trait taken from the original. I described it there as taking a job from a job system 
and breaking it down into small, equipable pieces that each level up on their own. A materia's level, I would say, is more important than a character's level as it drastically increases the potency of a spell or the length of a buff or even adds additional effects to some abilities. And your characters don't get locked into roles represented by these abilities because you can freely swap them between each other with very little difference in effectiveness. It kinda has to be that way since the party shifts around so much throughout the story, but their inherent stats do show a preference for certain materia like Aerith is definitely meant for magic and Tifa is meant for physical, but you can do what you want. How many materia slots an item has is one of the multiple factors you must weigh when choosing what to equip. And the added detail of actually seeing your materia on the in-game model is a lovely touch. Some of the slots are linked together which allows for blue materia to be used to modify or enhance other materia. It's always important to have element coverage and if you're being safe, everyone should have a heal of some sort. The rest are pretty up to you but I will say this, you are not getting your materia up to max level on a single playthrough. I only did it with Cure and some of the other element spells, but even though I prioritized others as soon as I got them, and got the upgrades that related to doubling AP and stuff, they require so much that I had no chance even if I got a ton of side content done. Like Raise, for example, can be upgraded into Arise, which revives someone to full health. I never unequipped that as soon as I got that, not even once, and I didn't get halfway through leveling that Materia up. Materia's true potential is only found in the post-game, which is unfortunate because most players won't see it, especially because you're gonna have to grind a lot. But when you have a library of maxed Materia to work with, each little orb you equip can change so much about a character. And what you change will be an integral part in how prepared you are for post-game bosses. Materia is cool, but in the original game, I had a gripe with it. They were kinda all you had in terms of character growth, especially after being cut down to just one armor slot and one accessory. The characters blended together because if you swapped all your Materia from Cloud and gave it to Barret, he would play more or less the same as Cloud. Their inherent stat differences did not have a huge effect on the casual story playthrough. This is fixed in Remake almost instantly with the action-based combat giving everyone unique default attacks and specials, but they go a few steps farther. Every weapon you find comes with a new ability only that character can use, including a unique proficiency goal to achieve by using said ability. When you hit 100% proficiency, that character permanently learns the ability even when they switch weapons and by the end, they'll be stacked with one-of-a-kind moves. Not only does this cement each character's identity, it also encourages experimentation to work with every weapon you get, and leveling up your character earns you SP, which can be spent on every weapon's unique upgradable tree, granting you stat boosts or even passive abilities. God, I despise the UI in this menu though. You go in and see a list of each choice on this node, but if you press up or down it just kind of sends you to a seemingly random one in the orbit and the list disappears and if you press it again you just fly to some other node in no clear order? It's actually awful, who came up with this? Just give me a list for god's sake. But the point is every character feels important and you want to use them all. By the final boss of Final Fantasy 7, I hadn't touched like half of the playable characters, and it didn't matter. 7 Remake only gives you a choice by the end game, but it's a hard choice. I love my boy Barret, but I had to go with Cloud T for Aerith. I know Rebirth is gonna expand everything, but I hope combat stays focused with the increased roster most of all. Oh, also, Barret has some melee weapons too. You could just change that about him. He did in the original, but it only changed like who he could target. It changes his whole playstyle and special attack in this. He turns into an AoE damaging tank. A less committed development team would say, eh, most people probably won't equip that anyway, so we don't want to redesign how Barret works just for like two of the weapons in the game. We don't need to include those. Or maybe we do, but we make them shoot normally somehow. No, there's no half-assing here. This is what I'm talking about. In my 15 video, I made a point about how modern advancements give newer games significant advantage over older classics, but many are nostalgia blind to this. I even called out 7 specifically. Some of the things 15 does are leaps and bounds better than 4, 5, 6. 
even seven, you simps. I got a comment calling me out saying it was superficial to say parts of a new game are better than an old game because of the graphics or that you can jump now. That's not what I meant. But I think 7 Remake is a much better example than 15. First of all, graphics do tend to improve a game's immersion. But let's not take into account the fidelity of the world, the immersive sound design, the voice acting, the orchestrated score. Forget all this stuff people put years of their life into to make. A modern game can give us a real representation of what kids in the 90s and early 2000s pictured in their head when they filled in the blanks of what the original Final Fantasy VII was capable of. Remake's combat could not exist on the PS1. Game developers, in some way, settle for what they can pull off at any time, and it's always been that way. The developers of Final Fantasy VII were so desperate to see their true vision realized they made an entire motion picture sequel to show off how cool fights could look. And in Final Fantasy VII Remake, they show off how cool fights can feel. But there's still no jump button, so 15's better. Speaking of Advent Children, I know I was forced to make a standalone review just on this one book, Final Fantasy VII On The Way To A Smile, as it was a prequel to Advent Children, there was another prequel to Advent Children book. And I could have included it in that video, but I decided not to when I discovered its connection with Seven Remake. Final Fantasy VII The Kids Are Alright, A Turks Side Story, is an obnoxiously titled novel that's only partially about the Turks and mostly about the kids who are alright. You notice a couple of NPCs in this game really stand out, like they're designed with intent, with their own unique outfits and names, but don't really affect the story? That girl who riles up the crowd in the Sector 7 slums to try and get money for news about Shinra. That guy who guards Corneo's mansion but regrets his choices. Main characters in this book that released exclusively in Japan in 2011 as what would be the last entry in the pre-remake compilation of Final Fantasy VII. It wasn't until 2019 when it finally got translated and that's probably because of this game being a year away. But that's so weird, I didn't hear anybody talk about this until I found it on one of my many Wikipedia deep dives I go on in between episodes of Rephoid. I won't explain it too thoroughly, just run down the basic gist of the plot and how the characters are relevant, but very minor spoilers ahead for the original seven if you care about that. Skip to the next chapter. Our main character is Evan Townshend, a kid with a bad heart and a drunk mom who lies to him about his dad dying in the Wutai War by stepping on a landmine. His mom hit financial disaster raising him alone, having to pay for a massive heart surgery for him, and then found out immediately after he needed brain surgery too, and he just never got it. Two years after the end of Final Fantasy VII, he's working with a group of kids running a con where people pay them to find lost belongings or people by contacting the life stream. The other kids are Leslie, Kyrie, and Fabio, who is not present in the remake to my knowledge. They meet regularly at Seventh Heaven to talk about how to get back at Shinra for all their wrongdoings. So Tifa knows them, and Kyrie even grew up with Aerith in Sector 5. Reno and Rude are ordered to investigate and get info out of them. After a couple cameos, Evan and the crew make their way to Don Corneo on a job. The main quest in this book is to find Evan's mom who disappeared long ago. The scene at Corneo's mansion reminds Leslie of his days working for the guy, the days we get to know him a bit in Remake. His fiance, Merle, got roped into Corneo's bridal audition thing that he does and also disappeared one day, so Leslie started working there in an attempt to find out what happened to her. He actually talks about this in Remake and we see a brief flashback couple of images of her. These are the only images we get to ever see of this character. And there's a whole chapter where Leslie cons us into getting back the pendant she gave him before she left by chasing an annoying little gremlin through the sewers a second time. It's probably the most fillery chapter in the whole game, but knowing the backstory at least helped it. He has a very clear motivation for betraying Corneo and helping you break out. Back in the book, Leslie finishes his revenge story by ultimately burning Corneo's mansion down to the ground. 
Meanwhile, Evan and Kyrie swim in a lake that turns black. Without realizing it, they witness the birth of Kadaj, who almost drowns Kyrie, then disguises himself as one of their friends. But Red 13 rescues her because he was there, I guess. This book is very guilty of the unnecessary cameo. So the Turks are kind of tracking them through this whole time, and Elena accidentally shoots Evan and pretends to feel bad about it, which is pretty funny. The clues that they're tracking of Evan's mom's whereabouts leads them to Icicle Lodge. Kadaj follows them, and there's a fight with him and the Turks. The inn burns down, and they go north, where his mom was apparently studying the hooded clone people. Evan and Kyrie get real banged up and almost die, but they fall in and out of little life stream pockets and eventually somehow reach his mom's dead body, along with a convenient note explaining her true backstory. Just with a note, she tells them she was the secretary at Shinra and signed an NDA punishable by death to get the money for Evan's heart surgery. After the president died, she spent the rest of her life trying to get the money for the brain surgery he never got. What was the deal to cover that much money? Well, she wasn't just a secretary of President Shinra. Turns out Evan's dad didn't die in the Wutai War and that was just a made up story. His real dad is the president, which means Rufus has a half brother. The note also stops to say, along my journey, I was helped by a man named Barrett, a man named Vincent, a man named Sid. Like they, she just lists the rest of the characters who didn't have proper cameos in the book. Like I said, of all the spin-offs, this one might be the most guilty of the this world is not allowed to be bigger than those few main characters syndrome. In the epilogue, they go to the doctor who performed the surgery, who reveals that after realizing this was Shinra's kid, he could con a lot more money out of them, so he actually completely made up the brain problem. He never actually needed surgery, he just wanted to get a bunch more money. She spent her whole life attempting to get the money for this surgery and died trying all for nothing. There's a great moment right after this where Sung hears about it and in rare form gets overwhelmed with anger and single-handedly beats the doctor up within an inch of death. So they come to an understanding with the Turks. They split off and go home. Advent Children happens and somehow they kind of miss everything that happens in that movie up until the cure for geostigma is found. And they vow to one day meet up with the friends they made in the Turks. And even his half-brother in the end. And that's that. None of these characters appear in that movie or any of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, but some were added in Remake just as a nice way to fill out the world. I like how they approached it. Leslie has a bigger role since you get involved in Corneo shenanigans, but Kyrie is just a con artist who lived in the slums, so she's just around. She's not important. You might miss her if you're not paying attention. I only notice on this playthrough that in Chapter 2, she's actually there just riding the train. No dialogue, just taking the train like a normal citizen would. 90% of players will think nothing of her, yet she has a novel's worth of backstory. It makes the world feel pretty rich. This is the stuff you like to see in the remake. This is the attention to detail these developers have. You can also meet another character from the book, a minor character, Muriel, who is Kyrie's grandmother who kind of taught her the ways of conning. She's totally optional through a side quest in the Sector 5 slums. And she had a great impact on the kids in the book, so they named their lying detective agency after her. What an honor. Finally, in intermission, you can fight Kyrie in a game of Fort Condor, and she's the only player who tries to charge you money for doing it. I believe that's every connection Remake has to this novel. It's small stuff. But I'm sure a lot of people watching had no idea about it. I certainly didn't until like a year ago. The question is, will this continue in Rebirth? I'm betting we're going to see a lot of stuff from the other games in the compilation. But it's possible. It's funny that the main character, Evan, doesn't even make an appearance in 7 Remake. But that's because he didn't grow up in the slums. He grew up topside, so they keep that consistency. I couldn't find any reference to his mom in Shinra Tower. You'd think they'd do that but no luck. The book is entirely Midgar focused, so if we're leaving Midgar and Rebirth, then it's unlikely we'll see them again, but who knows. Actually, what's the plan? Are, is Midgar not available at all in Rebirth? Because I, I get why you couldn't do the entire thing in this game, but 
you can't go back and visit it? Like, that's crazy. Probably not. But also, that's sad. But just keep a lookout. If you're playing Rebirth, you come across like a note or, or something, some kind of lore dropped in the world, and it mentions somebody named Townshend. Evan, or Annette, is his mom. That's from this book, and your old pal Tom told you all about it. Let's move on from side stories to side quests. They're a slightly controversial topic as well. That's because this is a linear game with open world style quests. Only in specific chapters, ones where you explore a town, will side quests be present. And you won't be able to continue the story without characters ominously warning you or even guilt tripping you. You know, we might not come back here for a very long time. Are you sure you wanna move on? No coming back, remember? Last chance to change your mind. You know, part of me wishes we could do more for the people down here before we take the fight to Shinra. Sure you want to go now? This can cause severe FOMO and make some people who are down with doing one or two side quests feel the need to do them all, and that is a major cut to the already snail speed pacing of the story. Me personally, I got that completionist bug when it comes to these things. I would probably stop the game myself to do it all even if I could come back later. I just enjoy getting rewards as early as possible so I can make the most out of them. But the structure still goes against itself. I can't imagine this problem would persist in Rebirth, but it wasn't much of a problem for me. Some side quests are fun, some are kinda tedious, but most involve unique dialogue and fun moments with your party. Another benefit to the linearity, the developers know in the Sector 5 slum quests, your party will always be Cloud and Aerith, so they can spend the time making unique dialogue with her on each one of them instead of trying to plan around whoever's in your chosen party at the time. This is another thing to keep in mind if Rebirth gives you way more freedom, it might be forced to cut this detail. There's unique character dialogue for every little side quest, even when the quest is just there's a materia over there, how do we get it? They'll discuss if it's worth going over there, or what it is. They'll make a comment when you trail off the beaten path specifically to go for it, and they'll get excited when you finally reach it. Like, that attention to detail made our little tangent worth it. But the materia is cool too. The optional stair climbing segment where you're actually forced to go up 60 flights of stairs and are awarded with nothing is unironically one of my favorite moments in the game. And so was the side quest where you gotta push a loose chair all across Shinra Tower. Nah, that wasn't a real side quest, I just did that for fun. But it should have been. I found all of these side quests more enjoyable than the ones I experienced in Final Fantasy XV, which felt more focused on quantity over quality like just about every other open world game. But sometimes you just don't want to do side quests, and I get it, which is why it's annoying that there are two forced side quest segments. When they tell you to look around or something while you wait for the next story thing, like they don't even hide the fact that they're making you kill time. In both cases, there is an obvious quick easy quest you can do, but it's still pretty annoying. As I said earlier, if you change your tune and let yourself stew in the world, you'll have a much better time. It's not as bad as some make it out to be. But you probably do want to do the wall market side quests because it affects what dress Aerith gets. On this playthrough, since I already did all that stuff before, I only beat the quick side quest with the gym bros, and I think she ended up in the worst dress. They play this dopey music and she's, oh, it's not so bad, right? Oh well, the Dawn doesn't have to pick you. <laughs> A lot of jokes in general about how Aerith, like, isn't pretty. What the heck is wrong with you people? In what world? Anyway, my main stance on the side content is that Rebirth might handle them overall better, but there might be something missing. Oh, and Chadley is so annoying, I hate him so much, and I don't know why, I just hate him. Every time he opens his mouth, I just tell him to shut up, instinctively, instantly. He is begging to be shoved in a locker. Okay, we've reached that point in the video. The normies are gone, we're deep enough. We already discussed the story. I didn't do a traditional recap. Story's fairly simple, except for one part. In this section of the video, we're gonna be discussing the most controversial part of this game. The whispers. And the new continuity. Heavy spoilers ahead for this game. One major spoiler for the original game. If you know the one, you know the one. 
and one major spoiler for Crisis Core as well, same deal. So the Whispers are cloaked, ghost-like beings whose specific purpose is to be an outside influence affecting the established Final Fantasy VII canon. Now when I first played, the Whispers didn't disturb me too much, it was all new to me. But even as an outsider, it's pretty easy to tell they were added in to subvert your expectations. This is what I was talking about when I described the game as a rebuild. It assumes you know how the first story is supposed to go. On this playthrough, I was much more keenly aware of whisper moments. Now that I know the original story, I admit these moments stick out as very obvious and I can totally see how they soured longtime fans. So what's the point of them? Well, they're an excuse to break up canon and set up the story to go in new directions. The plot of the game is more or less the same, just having these ghosts show up every now and then until the very end where it becomes all about destroying the mega ghost who commands all the other ghosts. It's pretty convoluted. To put it simply, the characters have to kill a god who is controlling their fate so that now they can put destiny in their own hands again. Except it feels totally shoehorned in to establish some sort of proper ending point for a story that was only just supposed to really begin here. It's been long enough, I suppose we should bring up Sephiroth. First seen in the original game when you reach the top of Shinra Tower and he kills the president, but this time he's scattered throughout the journey through Cloud's dreams and memories. All he does is say cryptic mumbo jumbo like he's an Organization 13 member. New players will be totally lost. Old players will get the feeling he knows about the events of the original timeline, and he's toying with Cloud or trying to make him realize too. There's only one other major character who similarly acts like this, and it's Aerith. We first meet the Whispers at the same time we first meet her, but the thing is, you can only see Whispers if you touch someone who could already see them, like an infection. That's how Cloud starts seeing them, and he passes it to the other characters unknowingly. But why could Aerith see them right away? I think she knows what's going on too. There's a pretty standout line from her in the beginning of this scene. Lovers used to give these when they were reunited. Then we have a number of other scenes where she talks about death, fate, making the most out of the time because you never know when you might lose it. Everyone dies eventually. I suppose. Like, it, it seems almost obvious. If she doesn't know what's going on here, then the writers are just being annoying. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go through every whisper moment in the game. I know everyone's prepping for a rebirth, so I'll get you up to speed on how exactly they affected the plot. So there's a big whisper outbreak in Sector 7 that goes away once Jesse gets hurt and was taken off the mission, forcing Cloud to take her place. They accompany Cloud on his fall into the church. Cloud sees Aerith again and has a flashback seeing her materia fall out of her hair from her last moments of life in the original Seven. When Aerith joins the party permanently, Cloud sheds a tear, as if some part of him knows where this is going. The Whispers stop Cloud from killing Reno. They stop Aerith from falling off a balcony. They're very present during the plate falling incident. Specifically, they're surrounding Biggs before Cloud reaches him, and then one stares him down as if it's trying to communicate something. Maybe I'm reading too far, maybe it's just like, hey, back off, Cloud. They're over Jesse too, who gets much more banged up. Now, in the ending cutscene, we see Biggs recovering in bed, but we're currently assuming Jesse is really gone. I believe they wanted both of them dead, but Biggs coming back just plays into the ending, which is all about establishing your own destiny and going against them. They make a wall so the gang can't stop Rude from initiating the plate fall. They surround Wedge in place when it does fall. This one is interesting because it seemed like with Biggs, they got away because Cloud chased them off, but there's no one around Wedge, yet he survives this moment. Did the Whispers protect him? If they wanted him dead, couldn't they just let the thing crush him? Side note, when Kate Sith appeared on my first playthrough during the drop, I thought someone was drugging me. I had to Google who was the cat to be sure I saw what I saw. Even knowing who Kate Sith is, there was no reason to cut to an upset anthropomorphic cat in that moment, it is so jarring. 
Later, they whisk the crew away when they're about to discover some underground Shinra experiments. When Hojo tells Cloud he wasn't a soldier, they whisk him away. He's not supposed to know that yet. When Wedge comes back, they whisk him away after he tries to help them. This is the last time we see Wedge and we don't know if he's alive. Soon later, when we rescue Aerith, they surround her and we have a discussion about them. Red finally explains that they are arbiters of fate because he's apparently an expert on whispers. And Aerith almost directly says, I feel like they want me to die or something. Oh, and speaking of, who could forget when Barrett died and the whispers healed him because that wasn't supposed to happen? I feel like that one was just toying with fans. See, what can the whispers do and not do? They have a power to heal a fatal wound? If they want to control the plot, can't they do that a lot easier than they're doing with everything else? Like, if they wanted Biggs dead, couldn't they just pick him up and, like, throw him off the cliff? Did they do that with Wedge? I mean, we saw that. Like, what's the power? What's the situation? What are the rules with the Whispers? That is not clear at all. Soon later, they fully surround Shinra Tower, and Rufus is the only one who can see. I believe this is because he made contact with Cloud during their fight. And that's basically it. The rest of the story is the team killing off the Whispers leader by jumping into some weird portal. So everything they do is about keeping events on track with the original story. They exist to be foiled by the main characters attempting to do something different in the finale. The one thing that doesn't add up is if Wedge is alive. Did they just mess up with him and Biggs? I don't know. But here's the thing that gets me. If they exist just to make sure everything happens a certain way, why are they part of the story? Why couldn't you just have those things happen with no ghosts? That's exactly how it went in the original story. I mean, I know the answer. It's just to establish them as the enemy for the to, to have a final boss. But like, they really ruined some iconic moments. It's a shame. When they explode away during the finale, it flashes back to Zack at the end of Crisis Core. Another completely confusing thing if this is your first jump into the series. This is the biggest change in story, and our heroes don't even directly cause it. Somehow, and I'm still very confused about it, Zack survives what was supposed to be his last stand, and he returns to Midgar. We see him cross paths with our crew, unaware and fully surrounded by light. Aerith is the only one who stops because she feels something. Is this the merging of two alternate timelines? So, yeah, there's a bunch of other references to changing canon. Aerith says if we step through the portal to Destiny's Crossroads, we can stop Sephiroth, but we'll be changing our fate forever. During the final boss, they receive a vision of Meteor and Red running through during the post credit scene of the first one, Aerith being dead just straight up. Red calls it, quote, visions of the future if we fail here. And then another classic quote, the final one from Sephiroth upon defeat. That which lies ahead does not exist. So, everyone kind of needs to take their stand on how much they accept the writers indulging in convoluted meta storytelling. I'm usually a fan of convoluted, weird, Nomura, as they say, stories, but it hits different when it's mangling one of the most beloved video game stories of all time, you know? While on the other hand, that means I won't exactly know where the story's gonna go when jumping into the next one, and that's exciting. But is it gonna end up being good, or is it gonna be stupid? And I'm just gonna say, wow, I wished you just stuck to the old story with extended sequences and stuff. I think most fans are forgiving enough with what's happened so far, kind of, most of them, but Rebirth is really going to be make or break. For the last four years, people have been wondering, is Aerith gonna die or what? To change a moment so important to gaming, just to be like, ooh, different timelines, oh, it's a sequel, it's meta, like... That would be game ruining for some people. Because if Rebirth ends and like, you know, Aerith lives, that's the big twist ending. We cut the credits when they're all ready to go off. It's like, what are they fighting for? I know the world, but a tremendous weight is taken off of the main character's shoulders. I love Aerith, but that's her story. 
How is she gonna stop Meteor? If she's not in the live stream. Are they gonna stop it with ghosts? Like, is it gonna be something stupid like that? There's very few ways that could go where I would be fully on board. Worst case scenario, in my opinion, she does die at the end of Rebirth, but they bring her back at the beginning of the next game and for four years we're like, oh, well, they did it, they killed her, but then they immediately reversed it. Oh, that would suck. Like, part three could be about getting her back. No, that would be stupid. I'm just going off the rails now. What I'm saying is Remake merely opened the doors for what Rebirth can do to the story. And people are gonna be upset with whatever happens. People are gonna be angry about any surprise. But the sooner you get on board and accept that this train is going off the rails, the more fun you'll have. I'm keeping my expectations low as long as they, as long as the characters are there and the dialogue's good. You can have your ghosts, man. The rest of the game is so good to me. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the conclusion, but we got one more thing to talk about, of course, the DLC. Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade was released just a few months after I started Refoid, and I was too busy playing Final Fantasy IV at the time to get around to it. There's literally nothing special about this version of the main game. It's all marketing. It makes it sound like a remastered version, maybe with some new features to give it a reason to be PS5 exclusive, but no, this is just an enhanced port like any other upgradable PS4 game. It doesn't even say it on the title screen. Intergrade is just the name of the bundle, essentially, that includes the original game and its new DLC, Episode Intermission. It's a small story starring Yuffie that's pretty jammed packed with new stuff. I talked about this a little bit back in my review of Dirge of Cerberus since it was only after playing that game I noticed the trailer, which shows Weiss and deep ground soldiers, things that were only in that game. Also, Yuffie's Moogle costume is originally from that as well. So going into this, I had two major questions. One, what's with all the Dirge of Cerberus stuff and how is Weiss there? And two, who the heck is Sonon? Well, he's your other party member for the adventure. It's Yuffie and Sonon on a quest to invade Shinra and steal the ultimate materia. He's brand new to Final Fantasy VII. The two meet up just because they were both assigned to do this. He exists just to have another party member for the game, which is kind of what I thought. With the combat now entirely focused on two characters, they added some cool new stuff. Sonon is not technically playable. You can't switch to him, but he does have ATB, health, equipment, unique abilities, everything but the switch. This is Yuffie's story. Because of the length, you get to start with a bunch of materia ready to use, even some leveled up, but she also has an ability to imbue her weapon with an element from the start, so you never have to worry about type coverage, it's great. She handles both physical and magic attacks very well, she has a projectile, she's good at fighting in the air, she's got AoE and a special huge damage ability that charges by using ATB, she even has a built-in perfect parry that staggers enemies, absolute powerhouse. Makes sense for this small experience that kind of needs to give you all the mechanics in one character, but if she was playable in the main game, she would probably just blow the other characters out of the water. I'm expecting a nerf in Rebirth. Now, Sonon isn't too special. He can hit pretty hard, but he's built around getting enemies off you or enhancing your attacks. One of his abilities is just to focus on attacking a particular enemy. He's kind of made to be your assistant who follows your orders. He's always calling you boss even though he's older than you, and he kills himself in place of you if your HP ever drops to zero. There's a new mechanic called Synergize. This calls Sonon to you and syncs your attacks up to boost your damage output and gives you access to much more powerful versions of your abilities. It took a little bit to figure out, but basically you gotta balance when it's better to fight separately and when you wanna go in for the kill together. Especially because Sonon's ATB charges much slower when synergized. A lot of spice was added to this little DLC, and it goes a long way. But it makes sense, since I think this mechanic or something like it will be in Rebirth, and so will Yuffie. It's like, ah, we're making this stuff anyway, let's give some of it early. It's still linear, but in Chapter 1, you'll be in the slums, and there's some side stuff you can do. The first is hunting down posters for the Happy Turtle, each accompanied by its own theme song in a different genre of music. They did all that composing for something you'll hear for two seconds. Also, you get a little Happy Turtle jingle playing through your controller. This is a 
amazing. What's that? What's that? <laughs> It takes place right before the plate falls in Sector 7, so apparently, in between when Cloud fell into the church and when the plate dropped, Happy Turtle Fever just sweeped this sector, and also, everyone got insanely addicted to this tabletop game called Fort Condor. They stuck a triple triad-esque side minigame in one town, in one DLC. Fort Condor is a competitive tower defense game that apparently everyone is just a big fan of. I gotta be honest, I did not like the Fort Condor minigame in the original. It was painfully slow and boring. I like this version. You can collect different toys here and there and build your team based on who you're fighting. There's a weapon triangle to show who might have an advantage in this fight, and I adore the blocky polygon toy-like aesthetic they went with that looks just like the original game did. They just put so much work into this. It would be crazy if it didn't appear in Rebirth. You should be going to the actual Fort Condor, so I don't know what the plan is. The only other side thing you can do is fight Ramu with Chadley. I highly suggest you do, because it's the only summon you can get in the game, and it's really nice to have. Overall, the DLC is oozing with polish and new mechanics that I actually feel bad that this stuff might only exist here alone. It's the perfect little appetizer for Rebirth, and some people still haven't played it. It only costs extra for OG PS4 players, but they value it at $20. Well worth it, in my opinion. If you have Intergrade, then you have this, so I highly suggest checking it out. There's even a little bit of revelation for the story, which I am about to spoil. So for the last time, please skip ahead to the conclusion if you don't want to hear it. For starters, you hang out with some other random squad of Avalanche members. I always forget it's bigger than just the characters we know. They call Baird and Tifa's squad the Splinter Cell because they're a bit more extreme. Like, yeah, we want to stick it to the man, but we don't want to blow up any reactors. The journey is just about Yuffie learning to sympathize with the people of Midgar while enacting revenge for the people of Wutai. And there are no whispers involved at all. Except potentially one if you try to approach the doors to Seventh Heaven, you get pushed back by a mysterious gust of wind. I'm assuming that's some whisper stuff. Sonon has a quick backstory of losing his sister in the war, so he sees her in Yuffie and he tries to become like a protective brother figure to her. Scarlet gets an unexpected spotlight in being the main conflict, sort of, that they encounter during their Shinra invasion, eventually getting desperate and enforcing deep ground stuff on them. So yeah, I finally got my answers. We fight invisible soldiers from Dirge of Cerberus, and we see her wake Weiss up temporarily, but he's not actually here. She sends him into the digital simulator or something. The real final boss is Nero, or Nero, I don't know which one it is. He's the other major antagonist from that game. Reminder, Dirge of Cerberus is still a PS2 exclusive, so I'm thinking the majority of players have no clue what's going on in this Hannibal Lecter edgelord part of the game. It's a tough fight, and in the end, Sonon dies protecting Yuffie from the darkness. Yeah, never saw that coming. Uh, a random character you added just to have another playable party member who doesn't exist in the rest of the story. Yeah, I couldn't have saw that. And also, Nero seems to get away. He like breaks out of the Shinra containment, he takes Sonon with him, he's he's just gone, we don't know where he is, maybe he'll show up in Rebirth. As Yuffie runs out of the facility crying, she witnesses the disastrous plate drop and soon sets off on her continued quest for revenge. But then in the post credit scene, we're treated to our main crew, still walking along, hitching a ride to Calm. Then cut to Zack entering the church to find that Aerith has gone. Okay, so what happened here? Zack was carrying Cloud and all beat up and stuff in the remake ending, which is all supposed to take place before any of the story is supposed to happen. Then in this ending, he seems fine in Midgar without Cloud. Was he just plucked from one timeline and placed here? Memories wiped? Maybe that's what happened with all of the other characters too. Is there any reason to speculate now, days away from the release of Rebirth? Maybe not. Oh, and when you beat it, you do unlock Weiss in the combat simulator in the main game. So you gotta fight him with your main crew. I don't know if any of this dirge stuff will matter in the immediate future. They were probably just looking for a powerful final boss and super boss and felt like it would be cool for all those Dirge fans to see this. But man, reloading my four-year-old game save with all the maxed out stuff to take him on was a treat. They do add in a rule that prevents you from using the free limit break item that you got for completing what was the hardest boss fight in the original. 
I was sad about that, but I understood. The Weiss fight is brutal. Absolutely brutal. Halfway through, he starts healing. He becomes immune to physical damage. He swoops around at crazy speeds. I felt like I didn't truly remember how to play this game until I figured this fight out and rebuilt my characters correctly. But even then, he has a die instantly attack if you take too long to kill him, or kinda just when he feels like it. It was a great last hurrah to this game, and I finally got to reclaim my 100% completion after four years. What to say after all we've been through? I like this game a lot. It favors most of the things I like in an RPG very well. It's not without its issues. I still don't think Materia is the best form of character growth. I've since started to grind it to build better characters for the post-game fights in intermission, and it's just annoying to deal with that. But it's good for main story purposes. I just don't see the hate in the combat. There are some areas that could be improved, but I'm still so impressed with what they've done. It does feel like the truest form of what they imagined Final Fantasy to be since the 90s. And I said in the 15 video that it's a shame the PS4 only had the one main line, but if we're being real, this game is as big and expensive and exciting as a main line. There's no reason why it shouldn't count. Give the PS4 a little more credit. And now, the PS5 has 16 and Rebirth, it's already got two, we're making a comeback. Is it blasphemous to say you like this game more than, say, a classic mainline title? It's only a third of a classic mainline title's story. I feel kinda guilty saying this is one of my favorite games in the series and it tops a good chunk of other mainlines. As far as padding and filler goes, when I played it the first time, I really didn't feel like it was that padded. It's only now that I know how the story's supposed to be paced that I see how long everything takes. On a second playthrough, you're really like, oh wow, so this whole chapter is just walking around town, huh? Okay. But there's something about how chill it all is that makes this game so comfortable to me. But then in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking, damn, it's crazy that this is just act one of three games. Like at the end of it all, you're gonna be able to look at all three of these games and start with this one for tens of hours and then jump right into part two and immediately take off the story from there and then part three. And it's gonna be one giant seamless adventure We've never seen anything quite like that in the video game medium. That's really exciting. Some people are still sleeping on how much of a dream come true this remake is. They're too hung up on the whisper stuff and they don't see like how much detail is being put into this because of how long it's gonna be because of how it's gonna be three games so they could spend that time. We can spend an entire game in Midgar. It's the objectively the most important place in the game, in the first game, so we should spend that much time there if given the chance. Like, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't like the whispers really either. Maybe the story's gonna end up being embarrassing by the end, but we're still gonna have three huge games over the course of so many years there's so much potential for what this next game and the game after can do i don't understand as a final fantasy 7 fan how you could not be excited you know talk about being a stick in the mud i'm just saying savor this moment if you love final fantasy 7 you got the jackpot of jackpots with this remake if you're one of those like they shouldn't change anything about the story the best case scenario would have been a direct remake with updated graphics and no change like shut up man <laughs> just shut up it's a very exciting time to be this close to rebirth and making this video and stuff if rebirth sticks the landing and has all the cool interesting detail that this game has while expanding it and multiplying the amount of stuff in it that's gonna be some game. 
Hope you guys have fun with it. I, uh... Should probably go. I miss it, the steel sky. 